and welcome to this special edition of To The Point. Uh, the Prime Minister inaugurated a new scheme yesterday, the idea of direct cash transfer uh, as subsidies to poor families, the target population of such subsidies. Uh, now, this plan is linked with the Aadhaar plan. This, uh, as the government hopes, will cut help cut the transmission and distribution losses uh, in the present subsidy regime. And to discuss this particular scheme, we have with us a very special guest, Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia. Thank you, sir, for coming on to the point. Now, the opposition, if I can get straight into it, the opposition has accused the government of being in a rush to roll out this particular scheme. Um, they say it's part of a pre-election vote garnering strategy. But there are indications, sir, that especially after the first pilot in Alwar, Rajasthan, um, the government might be on to something that's really effective in distributing subsidies to the targeted families. Tell us a bit more about the pilot projects, if you could. A report in the major business paper claimed that uh, in that particular district in Alwar, Rajasthan, the kerosene offtake, if my figures are correct, dropped from 80 kiloliters to only 14 kiloliters or by 80%. Now, that's supposed to be good news, isn't it? No, no, it's very good news. But let me, let me explain one thing. You know, uh, many people think of the cash transfer as a substitution of some of the existing subsidy programs. But it's also a substitution of some of the straight cash transfer programs. And for example, there are very many schemes which give scholarships to children. And those scholarships at the present moment have to be collected. There's a check or money or something. Uh, there are also cash transfers like, for example, the Janani Suraksha Yojana. A uh, woman goes to have a delivery in an institutional delivery. Uh, if she does that, then she gets a cash transfer. So the, in the first instance, what is going to happen is that things that are meant to be cash transfers are going to be done electronically so that you don't actually go to someone and collect cash or collect a check. The money is electronically transferred directly into your bank account. It's a more efficient uh, type of subsidy. You, well, efficient in two ways. I mean, first it avoids duplication. I mean, the, the unique ID part means that, you know, only one and uh, there's only one person associated with that number. And the fact that, that is the person concerned who's claiming the benefit mm -hmm. is that person is biometrically identified. Mm -hmm. So that basically uh, eliminates the duplication of people. Mm -hmm. In other words, the same person getting benefits under five different names, which mm. is not uncommon. Mm. The second is it's very fast in the sense that the moment you've uh, sent the money out, that these people with this ID number have to have their bank account credited, it'll virtually be credited instantly. And cut out all that intermediation and people saying, nee, aapka check nahi aaya, paise nahi aaya, and all this. Now, you know, at the lower income level, the amount of time saved by having this kind of mechanism, as opposed to having to go somewhere to collect the money, is enormous. Mm. I mean, a poor person going anywhere to collect anything is shoved at the end of the queue, not treated well, not given any importance, etc., etc. Right, right. You cut through all that. Right. And then the last, last benefit is, all of a sudden these people have bank accounts. I mean, it's not as if they have any more money in the bank account than is being given to them. But you know, the fact that they've got included, they, uh, they have accounts, they put some of their savings ultimately into mm. those accounts. Mm. I mean, these are huge benefits in terms it's, of financial It's interesting, inclusion. sir, you mentioned the bank accounts. A uh, lot of chief, a lot, uh, many, many chief ministers, the day before yesterday, I think recently last week, they had a conference. They met uh, Peach Dhamram, the finance minister, and they called the system faulty, including Sheila Deshit, the chief minister of Delhi. Uh, they've called the system fa uh, faulty. They said the system is not efficient enough and will be a harassment for the common man, their words, not mine, uh, trying to open a bank account. What is the plan of the government to address these issues? The finance ministry has been talking about special camps regarding these. No, that's an extremely good point. And, you know, the key issue here is the Reserve Bank has pretty much instructed banks that you don't apply what are normally called know your client, KYC right. uh, criteria uh, to open an account if a person has an Aadhaar number. So they can actually use it if they don't have an Aadhaar card either. So Sorry? they can use the election voter ID for the Aadhaar No, no, uh, you don't need an Aadhaar, mm. but you know, for anything else, it's not enough to have an election ID. Mm. I mean, they might say, get an introduction from somebody who is in the bank. Mm. See, the idea is to avoid people opening multiple bank accounts, mm. okay? The great advantage of the Aadhaar number is that if there's more than one bank account with the same Aadhaar number, you know that there's Absolutely. more than one bank account. Right. 
So the rule is for a no frills account. Now that I think limits the amount of transaction in the course of one month or something. Banks will simply say, you have an Aadhaar number, here's your account. Now I know that banks don't normally like to open accounts for small amounts, it's a hassle. Mm. They're going to be forced to do it. It's possible that here and there, uh, in, initially, uh, you may find that you know somebody is not given the service that he demands. But it's very easy for the banking system to set up complaint mechanisms mm. where if a person with an Aadhaar number has applied for a bank account and hasn't been given it, I mean, it's quite easy to make sure that there are penalties to that. Right. You know, it may be initially that things sort of take time. Remember another thing. When large sums of money get floated through this system, mm. banks themselves will see the value of it. You know, at the moment, the banks only see these things as opening some little account in which no money is going to come. But if you look at the total flow of money, it'll be thousands of crores that will be going into the banks directly uh, by the government. So from their point of view, the benefit of float and all of those kinds of things will start operating. The banks never say no to money. Uh, very few people, sir, will argue that the present, the current distribution system uh, is reaching all the recipients, intended recipients. We all understand it's a, it's a pretty old system. It has flaws, it has gaping holes in it. Uh, it is said that the government spends about 3 rupees 60 paise uh, on transferring every 1 rupee to the poor. How far will this skewed ratio be rationalized after the direct cash transfer comes into full force? Can you tell us anything about you that? You see, I think these, uh, one of the problems with this calculation are that they look at the total cost and they look at uh, how much of this is actually going to the poor. And it turns out that a lot of the subsidies are either simply leaking out, in other words, they're being taken away. Middlemen doubts. Uh, yeah, that kind of thing. Mm. Or they're going to people, but they're not poor. Mm. I mean, the Sarpanch's family gives themselves BPL cards. Mm. So it's, uh, the real issue is, how do you really identify who should be beneficiaries? Mm. Now, one of the big advantages of the Aadhaar system is, no one person can call himself more than four beneficiary, more than one beneficiary. So right. it won't be registered under a different name. That'll automatically disappear. Mm. I would say that there's a second question that, you know, could it be that once money is being paid in cash, that misidentification will be resented much more? Mm. You know, it's one thing to sort of have, an, have a BPL card, go to the shop, the shop doesn't give you the stuff, they mm. say come back tomorrow. Whereas the uh, Pradhan's uh, daughter-in-law gets it regularly. Mm. It's quite another to sort of know that X or Y, who is living in a much better house than you, mm. is getting a bank transfer to his account uh, and you haven't been given it. So I believe that uh, the pressure of the system to avoid misallocation will increase hugely. Right. Uh, sir, I'd like to uh, like you to speak on a little more on this particular issue of how to eliminate leakage and, and, and plug the holes. But that's after a small break. More with Dr. Aluwalia on the other side of this break. Keep watching. Welcome back to the special edition of To the Point. Still in conversation with Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, sir. Most experts agree that the cash transfer scheme hinges on plugging the leaks. There are gaping holes, we all agree, but already there have been holes that have been found. The Bangalore police, there was a case, they busted uh, a racket where uh, fake UIDs were there with UID logos as well. Can we be sure now that middlemen, touts and, and such like uh, won't be able to use the Aadhaar's linked system to the benefit, uh, to their own benefit and continue to rob the intended recipients of uh, the direct cash transfer subsidies? What security systems can be in place, are in place or will be in place in the future? No, that's a very good question. You know, it's quite easy to duplicate uh, what looks like an Aadhaar number mm -hmm. or a card. Uh, but that's not the point. Uh, the point about Aadhaar is that you don't show uh, a letter saying this is your number. You authenticate your identity by going to a, a biometric reading machine. So technology so kicks you in. Could, yeah, you could come saying this is the logo and this is my number and I'm so and so. But you know, when money is being transferred, I mean, the relevant gateway uh, will sort of ask for your thumb imprint. And only if your thumb imprint matches the thumb imprint associated with that number, 
uh, in the uh, Aadhaar database, will you be certified to be the person you are? Right. So you can have these cards, but cards are not important. Actually, technically, you don't need the card. Hmm. The essence of uh, UID is that your identification is done online, but somewhere in the cloud. It's not based on somebody showing a card and saying it's not like a driver's license. So your license details are in the system, so it's quite foolproof as, as experts. Uh, in to the best of my know. knowledge, I mean, this is not my area, but mm. those who worry about false IDs actually haven't understood mm. the what technological the nature right. of the whole thing. <laughs> right, right. Uh, many oppose this particular scheme also because saying that this rural areas especially, recipients will struggle to spend the cash they receive because they could very well go off and spend it on country hooch or, or drugs for that matter even. Um, these critics also say that rather than switch to cash, food rations could be delivered much better as has started to happen in certain states. Now, Raman Singh, uh, the BJP rule state... Well, let's, no, no, let's stop here. The first point that, you know, poor people don't know how to spend money and will spend it on drink. Whoever is saying this is falling into the trap of the Victorian upper classes in England because that is what they used to say, hmm. that the poor will just spend their money on drink. I mean, the truth of the matter is... The logic of this would be that do not pay anybody minimum wages, give them sacks of grain. I mean, I just don't think that this makes any sense at all. It's a patronizing upper class bias. Hmm. What I do believe, and that's very important, wherever an entitlement is there, it ought to be given to the woman in the household. Hmm. Now, there's lots of sociological work that shows you that men who will spend their own wages on drink, and I think, regrettably, many of them do, do will not actually grab the woman's money which is given to her in order to whatever improve family health, family nutrition, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So frankly, I think that, you know, as long as you make sure that the money goes to the right person, I mean, the notion that it will be hugely misspent is totally wrong. Right. And secondly, what is the difference between giving grain? I mean, if the men are that brutal, they'll just grab the grain and sell it. So this is a complete, in my view, completely unjustified fear. And you think it should that be hit on the head. That argument doesn't really stand. Point taken, sir, fair point. We were talking about Chhattisgarh uh, and, and the claims by the Chief Minister in that particular state. Now, he claims that uh, the state system is now transparent completely without the Aadhaar link based system. Food deliveries by lorry are tracked by modern GPS technology systems. Local councils, rather than privately run ration shops, uh, oversee storage and distribution. The state government also claims that malnutrition and infant mortality are down as a result of these changes. Thoughts on this particular alternative, a better distribution and effective delivery through the old system. Can that really happen? Uh, if these states claim that they do not need the Aadhaar-based system, is there, does that argument hold any water for, for you? Well, let me say, I'm, I'm not in favor of forcing systems down people if they don't actually want it. Um, I wouldn't like to say that an alternative system cannot be perfect. What I am saying is that the probability of misuse in the Aadhaar system is minimized Minimal. massively. Mm. If, on the other hand, you want to follow a system where you are tracing lorries, you are checking the quality of the grain, you CCTV cameras in every shop in order to see whether somebody is being kept waiting, well, you may do that uh, and you may be able to reduce leakage. But, you know, it's not, in my view, the way to go. I mm. mean, ask yourself the simple question. If the government said you are entitled to a certain amount of support, wouldn't you prefer that they just give the money to you in, in your bank account? I mean, another way of looking at it, though, is people don't, you may not want to give a person money uh, to spend on whatever he wants. It doesn't mean drink. It could mean clothes mm. or movies Anything. or something. Mm. You may want, and I think this makes a lot of sense, you may want to give money, mm. which is to be used for food. But why would you link it to a particular type of food? Mm. I mean, it would be much better, in my view, to authorize a large number of shops mm. to accept money, uh, electronic credit, for the purchase of a variety of foods. You know, let's take a small farmer. A small farmer who is able to grow his own wheat or his own paddy still needs some support, may want to use it to buy eggs or milk or edible oil. So this whole idea of glorifying uh, a, a system in which one or two items are sold cheap mm. I think misses the fact that the food basket has now diversified enormously. Hmm. And people's need for food actually goes beyond food grade. So you're saying they're missing the big picture then? I, look, I think, I think we ought to ask ourselves, we should not get hung up 
on any particular system. We should certainly accept that any particular system can be run more efficiently uh, than less efficiently. And mm. in some states, it's probably run very efficiently. In other states, not so efficiently. Right. But if you were looking at it just analytically, what is it that you want? And I think if the first question is, if you want to transfer money to the poor, the electronic and the biometric identification provides you the foolproof way of doing it. Right. If you want to link it that it's not just money, it's actually money to help the family, I would give it to the woman. You can be 100% sure that a woman will spend the money very wisely right. in the interest of children. Right. Uh, but if you feel that you know maybe she'll go for clothes rather than food, well, you could have a system where shops, you don't subsidize the product. The shops are there, the mm. PDS is there. Mm. But you tell the PDS shopkeeper that, listen, you can keep rice and you can keep wheat and you can keep eggs and you can keep edible oil, you can keep milk and a whole lot of other kinds of things that you know help in the nutrition. And for the purchase of any of these things, you can get credit and then give the money, so, give the product. Now, to my mind, that is efficient, that is sensible. Right. And it might, it'll, there'll be transition problem. I mean, any new system. Any new system has transition problem. problem. We, we understand yeah. that. So we'll take us another small break. After the break, I would like to talk to you about your friends on the left, in the left, uh, and what they think of the other. Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll take another short break. More with Dr. Aluwalia on the other side of this break. Welcome back to uh, the special edition of To The Point. Uh, Dr. Alwalia, the opposition, especially the left parties, uh, they want the government to provide uh, for a universal public distribution system without dividing the people on the lines of a poverty line. This is right up your alley, sir. The question, sir, is uh, they don't want to divide it on the basis of a poverty line, APL or BPL, what have you, in the categories. How do you view the argument in the backdrop of this particular scheme and the Aadhaar link based system? Well, you know, the argument about giving a universal entitlement, uh, I mean, the only argument against it is what is the resource cost? That's mm. part. Mm. I mean, if you're going to give it to everybody, it's just going to cost a lot more money. Mm. We must be realistic in the sense that every government operates under a resource constraint. So if you decide to give it universally, uh, what will happen is you'll be giving less to each person. If you decide to target it, you can give more to the people who really need. In my view, the latter is the sensible thing to do. Now, the argument against that is that when you try to target, you miss out certain people who deserve it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that if you're making a small error, that that justifies a huge inclusion. You have to decide how many people in this country actually need support for food and how should it be given. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, if, if you think 90% of the country needs support for food, you might as well make a general entitlement program and you give the support for the kind of things that rich people won't buy. Right. But you know, if the poverty line is anywhere, even if it's near the middle, 40%, 50%, something like that, to give an entitlement to the remaining 50%, you know for sure what you're doing is you're cutting the amount you can give to the poor. Hmm. Remember, the very poorest need more than the poor and they need more than the guys who are just above the poor. And they certainly, uh, the ones above that, don't need it at all. Dr. How can you how can you respond sensibly to make it universal? I don't see that at all. Dr. Aliwale, it's very interesting you mentioned the poorest of the poor. My next question is about those particular people. Now, to my mind at least, uh, no matter what the critics and the experts say, the biggest problem or the biggest roadblock or obstacle in the Aadhaar link based program is this. Uh, the issue of proof of address. Now, the RBI notification and the clarification says that the banks must continue to get proof of current address. Also, uh, cash transfer is dependent on access to a bank account. They need proof of address for that. Now, the poorest Indians, pavement dwellers, uh, people who live on the streets, sleep on the road, uh, they, they have no residences, uh, addresses to their name. Uh, also, according to a survey, sir, not more than 18% of rural India, 28% of rural men and a mere 6% of rural women have bank accounts. Now, explain to us how we can get over the issue of address proof for people like that with no residence addresses and residence proofs to their names. No, I, let me say that, um, first of all, the percentage of people that have no residential address, in the sense that they live on the street, is actually not that huge. People, it's a pretty substantial number. Well, but I actually try and estimate it. I mean, you won't find that it's, it's not 20%, it's not even 10%. 
Uh, when I say a lot of people will tell you where they live and they're probably hugely crowded, etc. Mm. Technically, in my view, technically, an Aadhaar number should be given to anyone, mm. even if they don't have an address, in the sense that if it says under the third lamppost on the left of the that legal cinema, enough. you should give it to them. Mm. Because all that the Aadhaar number does, it enables you to say, this person has this fingerprint. That's mm. all. And then if somebody else claims to this per be this person and doesn't have the fingerprint, he's out. Mm. So that's point number one. Mm. Now point number two on bank accounts. It's absolutely true that huge numbers of people don't have bank accounts. Many of the poor actually rely on post office accounts. And we've encouraged that also in the past. Mm. Now, we do want to go to financial inclusion, but we shouldn't rule out post office accounts. Mm. So the first mm. thing is, post office accounts should go to something like a common banking solution. So that, you know, anywhere in the country, you know that the person has a post office. This is not a big thing to do, but it can be done. Mm. As far as banks are concerned, it is very clear that the current regulations say, uh, I don't know in detail if they're being done, by mm. the way, but mm. the, the current policy position is the following. If a person has an Aadhaar number, you shall open an account in his name, which will be a no-frill account. Mm. You know, you can't go and you know, just put in 50,000 rupees and take that money out or give it to someone. Some limit is there. Uh, it may be that the banks aren't doing it, but I think it's very easy for us to force the banks to do it. It's simply a condition of the license. And it may take a week, it may two, take two weeks, but it won't take three months. And the finance minister is very clear on that. And I'm in favor of actually forcing the banks. Mm. It's a very simple transaction. Mm. All you have to do is just open the account. Uh, and I think that will happen. And the second thing is banks will be much more willing to see it happen Once if the they government. know that you know 150,000 crore is going to pour into this. Right, right. If one bank doesn't, some other bank will. Right, right. Now you don't have to physically go hmm. to a bank branch right. in order to open a, a bank account. I mean, this is very crucial. Right. All banks. It is said that each village will have a banking correspondent. Some guy with a little a business ADM type, mm -hmm. business, sorry, business correspondent, mm -hmm. uh, who would be able to do certain kind of things as an agent of the bank. Mm -hmm. So if he has a little machine, which essentially enables him to read your fingerprint, all he has to do is to say, well, here's this guy, here's his fingerprint, please open a KYC account in his name, and it's opened. Absolutely. Now thereafter, thereafter, this person can draw that money without having to go to the branch of the bank. He can draw it from any business correspondent. Right. Point taken, sir. One more. Everyone agrees, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on, uh, implementation of a, such an ambitious project is going to be a problem because people can agree about the merits and demerits of the thing, but everyone agrees that implementation and plugging the holes is the biggest difficulty that the government will come up against. Uh, this also includes identifying individual beneficiaries, which in most cases is, is done by the states. Also, only 21 crore people have Aadhaar numbers by now. Uh, Mr. Nilekani has promised that uh, by the end of uh, 2018, the number will be almost double or triple. I don't know exact details. Also, the big problem is the Aadhaar bill hasn't been passed by parliament right now. Now, do you think in the face of all these facts, some of the scoffing that the opposition is doing right now is pretty valid? No, no, let me explain. Uh I don't think that uh, we would like uh, the Aadhaar, the UIDAI, to become a statutory authority in due course. Mm. Uh, but it's not, nothing that they're doing is legally invalid uh, without uh, the bill, parliamentary the bill, right, sanction. Right. So they're functioning as an operating organization and they can continue to function as long as banks accept the credibility mm. of the Aadhaar platform. Uh, we don't need to have laws in place. And remember, Unlike the uh, National Population Register, which is a legal mandate, uh, you are required to get registered under the National Population Register. Mm. You're not actually required under the law to have an ID number. Mm. It's simply that if you have an ID number and you want to get benefits from the government, it's going to be a lot easier. Mm. Mm. So it's a completely voluntary process. Right. Now, on the issue of implementation, you know, any bank scheme, any bank, any government scheme, uh, is as good as the implementation. Yeah. And we know that implementation is a huge problem. Mm. Now, let's be clear. Nobody can reasonably say that the existing systems are being completely flawless. Mm. Mm. They have huge problems. Mm. We're bringing in a new system. 
I think it's not generally realized that this is not just a new system. It's unique in the whole world. There is no other global biometric database covering 200 million people as of now, right. and maybe 600 million people by the end of the year. So it's a path-breaking project. It's a path-breaking. Now, yeah. rule number one is when you engage on a path-breaking project, the first thing you should say on a path-breaking project is to congratulate the government for doing a path-breaking project. Not do a lot of rona dhona saying, oh, it's path-breaking, you can't do it. Mm. Now, there's a lot of naysaying going on. Yes, let's first accept that is path-breaking, it's a game-changer. If it works, it'll be fantastic. I fully agree that we should spend the maximum amount of time and energy to make sure that there are no glitches. Now, I'm sure that Nandan will do a superb job, but let me say that let's not jump up at the first glitch. Mm. I mean, there's nothing that doesn't have a glitch. The question is, if there's a glitch, how soon do you fix it? And secondly, do you think that the existing system doesn't have problem? Mm. I mean, look, it's widely known that the leakage, for example, in kerosene is as much as 50%. True. There's no question that in the yeah. Aadhaar scheme, you will have comparable, none whatsoever. Right. So I don't think we should have any doubts on this, but I fully agree. Uh, if we are to be watchful, uh, if, we are, if we have the interest of the people at heart, we should keep a close tab on how it's rolling out. The other people should be receptive to criticism, as should the government. True. And we should set up a mechanism to quickly respond. Right. But to point to these things as, as negatives mm. uh, it's, is, it's I think, like wrong. Right. And you should certainly not oppose the scheme on this ground. Absolutely. On that note, sir, we must thank you for coming on uh, to the point. That was uh, Dr. Monte Singh Aluwalia, Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission. We just had a chat, a very interesting chat, on the correct cash transfer subsidy system that the Prime Minister launched just recently. Thank you so much.